Record. Oh, I'm on the wrong screen. Hold on. There it is. All right. Can everybody see that little PowerPoint I put together? Yes. yes. Okay. Very yeah. good. All right. So, um, what we're going to do, uh, it's a fairly short little PowerPoint, but it has a lot of physiology information in it that is important. Um, so it, when we get done with it, if you have any questions, then, you know, you can ask me if not, then we'll try and go into the anatomy thing to see if we can do that little game. Um, also, I want to remind everybody, technically, your assignments for each exercise is supposed to be completed by the end of the day that we had lab. So a lot of y'all already did it, and that's fine, but there's a few students in the class that haven't completed half of the assignments for exercises one through three. Now, technically, today is when you, you can do exercise three. A lot of people have already done it though, which is great. You always want to be ahead, by the way. You don't want to wait until the day to do it. So if you are behind on that, today is a day to catch up and into tomorrow. Um, next Monday, we're going to talk about a few things and have a little review. And then by the end of the day on Monday is when your practical is going to be due. So I'm going to leave it open until I'll probably open it Sunday and then leave it open through uh, Monday night. So you have time to take it. The physiology test is supposed to be completed next Wednesday. So I'll probably open that test on Tuesday and have it open until uh, Wednesday night. All right, so that's kind of what I'm planning with that. So if you are behind, you can still catch up. It's not, it, it's obviously not too late. All right, so let's get into this a little bit. <clears throat> Um, if you've done your, your exercises, you notice that there's a model of an arteries and veins. You have to identify the different layers of them. So on this picture, it shows an artery on the left, a vein on the right, and then a, a capillary, the smallest of the cardiovascular blood vessels, uh, vessels in the body. There are some major differences between arteries and veins that you obviously should know. One arteries carry blood away from the heart. So all blood vessels in the body that carry blood away from the heart towards the tissues in the body are called arteries. A small artery is called an arteriole. Veins are the blood vessels in the body that carry blood back to the heart from a tissue. So as you can see on this, this simple diagram here, there's different layers to the wall of the vessels. And one difference you notice right away is that the wall of an artery is thicker than the wall of a vein. So comparably sized arteries and veins, the artery will always be thicker, all right? The wall and veins will be thinner. Um, veins also have valves in them, one-way valves that prevents blood from backflowing down a vein. That is important because it helps maintain a return of blood to the heart because ultimately the pressures in a vein are much lower than the pressures in an artery. So um, on those exercises, and, and I'm sure uh, I saw a couple of questions on the practical, you have to identify these layers. So I'm just gonna tell you, that the wall of the vessel is separated into three main groups and they're all called tunica something. Tunica interna, the tunica media, and the tunica externa. So the tunica interna includes the endothelial lining, which is a simple squamous epithelium you learned about in P1. All blood vessels and all capillaries, and any vessel in the body is lined by a, a sheet of simple squamous cells, but it's referred to as endothelium because it's within the vessel, but it's still simple squamous. So that's part of the tunica interna. Just on the outside of that epithelial layer, there's a basement membrane. 
all epithelial tissues have a basement membrane. And then we have some elastic tissue. The first layer of elastic tissue, which you see is lumped into the tunica interna, is called the internal elastic lamina. And the artist of this picture at least made the elastic tissue look like Swiss cheese with these little holes in it. So um, on some of the models, it looks like little strings. Some of them have these little holes, but nonetheless, that represents elastic tissue. The thickest layer of the wall of a, of a vessel, um, especially in an artery, is the tunica media. The tunica media is comprised of smooth muscle tissue that surrounds the vessel. Um, and also, at least in arteries, there is um, an extra layer of elastic tissue. It's called the external elastic lamina. And then just the outside connective tissue, collagen fibers and whatnot on the outside binding the vessel together is called the tunica externa. So we have those layers. Some of them are missing, like some of the uh, elastic laminal layers. But nonetheless, you have internal layer, medial layer, and the external in a vein as well. But that's different in a capillary. Capillaries don't have all of these. A capillary by structure is the simplest of the blood vessels. It's also the smallest. It's basically nothing more than an endothelial lining with a basement membrane that surrounds it. And the reason why that's important, which we're going to cover in lecture, not so much in lab, is because capillaries are the, the blood vessels in the body where all of the oxygen and nutrients and waste are transported to and from the blood and the body cells everywhere. So body cells would be all around the capillaries. They would gain oxygen and nutrients from the capillary. They would dump in their waste products and carbon dioxide. That's all called capillary exchange. We're going to cover that in lecture. All right, so I left here um, the slide with some animations on it. You can click on those at a later time so you can view them. It's the same ones for lecture. So if you view them now, you know, you'll already have viewed them for lecture as well. All right, so we have to talk about blood pressure today. Um, on Monday, we talked about the physiology of cardiac output. If you remember, cardiac output is the volume of blood that is pumped out of the heart every minute. You guys remember that? So ultimately total blood flow through the body and through all the tissues, the total blood volume flow through the body is equal to the volume of blood that the heart pumps out every minute, which just so happens to be cardiac output. So at rest, when you're not physically active, your cardiac output equals your total blood volume in your body, which ranges in females four to five liters and males uh, five to six liters. So in one minute, your, your heart is ejecting out, you know, four to six liters of blood, depending on your body size, if you're male or female. All right, so all of that can change though, if you start working out or you become physically active, which I wanna talk about that concept again today. We hinted on that when we dealt with the factors of cardiac output, and we're going to cover it again a little bit today. So cardiac output is dependent upon, if you remember, the amount of times your heart beats per minute, your heart rate, and how much blood volume is pumped out on each beat, which is called stroke volume. So if you know how much blood volume is pumped out on each beat, and you know how many times a minute your, beat, your heart beats, then you know the volume per minute. And that's what cardiac output is, volume per minute, milliliters per minute. Here's another uh, animation I put in there, regulation of cardiac output. You can review that. So let's get into blood pressure a little bit. Now, if I ask you all to write down a definition of blood pressure, could you write down a definition for blood pressure? I mean, I know everybody knows, oh, I know what blood pressure is, you know, blood pressure is, well, is blood pressure, right? We know the term, but do we actually know what it really is? Well, blood pressure is a force. It's the force of blood exerted on the inside wall of a vessel when the blood is moving through the vessel. 
All right? So I'll give you a simple example. If you push on a door that's shut and you're trying to open it, you're going to exert a force onto the door as you were pushing it. Well, that's exactly what blood does to the inside of a blood vessel. As it's moving through the vessel, it is applying force against the wall of the vessel. So that's what we call blood pressure. The force that blood exerts on the inside wall of a vessel as it moves through the vessel. So not too bad, right? Well, we also have to talk about resistance in a minute, which is the exact opposite force. And resistance is the force that the blood vessel wall pushes back against the blood as the blood is moving through the vessel. So I'm gonna give you a simple example. Blood pressure and resistance are two opposite forces. Let's say you had a swinging door and you had one person on one side and one person on the other side. Both of them are trying to go in the direction in which you are in, pushing on the door. So one person's pushing from the outside, one person's pushing from the inside, and those two forces is the analogy of blood pressure to resistance. So resistance, the blood, the blood vessel is pushing against the blood, but the blood also pushes against the vessel. And the blood that pushes against the vessel, the force is just called blood pressure. So blood pressure is actually determined by how much blood your heart ejects into a vessel over time, how much blood volume is in the system, the cardiovascular system, and what the resistance of the blood vessels are. In other words, how much force are the vessels applying against the moving blood? So we're gonna talk about those parameters that affect resistance and thus will ultimately affect blood pressure. Before we do that though, I want you guys to look at this little chart. So blood pressure has a number. You guys are familiar with the number, you know, 120 over 80. You know, you go to the doctor, they take your blood pressure. Oh, your pressure is 100 over 70, uh, 130 over 85, whatever. It's two numbers, right? So the top number of your blood pressure value is called the systolic pressure. The systolic pressure inside of a blood vessel is the pressure exerted by the blood against the wall of the vessel when the ventricles are contracting. So when the ventricles are actively contracting to eject blood out into the arteries, that would produce what we call the systolic pressure. Remember the term systolic means contraction. So when the ventricles are in what we call systole, we would record the systolic pressure. Now the bottom number of your blood pressure is called the diastolic pressure. The diastolic pressure or the pressure inside the blood vessel when the ventricles are relaxing is always a lower number. Systolic pressures are higher, diastolic pressures are lower. So you always have that, say, 120 over 80, whatever the value is, right? Now, there is a way to calculate this purple line in the middle that you see in this chart. So you see the blood pressure, the, the, the bump goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. This is with your heartbeat. So when your heart contracts, your pressure is higher. When the heart relaxes, the pressure is lower. Pretty simple but we have something called the mean arterial pressure. And I'm going to need you guys to know how to calculate the mean arterial pressure. So the mean arterial pressure basically is the median pressure. That's what you see this little purple line. And that is the pressure that drives blood flow through the body, the mean arterial pressure. And it's generated from systolic and diastolic, systolic and diastolic differences in values. So I put in here a little animation, goes over mean arterial blood pressure a little bit. I also wrote in a, I find this formula a little bit 
simpler than the one that's in your engage manual. This is the one I like to teach. It involves three things. It involves something called pulse pressure, which is abbreviated PP. It involves something called systolic pressure and then diastolic pressure that I just mentioned. So the abbreviations are PP for pulse pressure, SP and DP, systolic and diastolic pressure. Not too bad. Now, if you take the pulse pressure and divide by three and then add back whatever the diastolic pressure volume is, that is a very good estimation of what we call mean arterial pressure in a person's body. So for instance, if you did it for the textbook values, 120 over 80, if you took 120 over 80 and calculated mean arterial pressure, it would look like this. First of all, you have to know how to get pulse pressure. So pulse pressure is pretty easy. It's systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure. So if you had 120 over 80, this would be 120 minus 80. So what would the pulse pressure be? Somebody unmute and tell me. Nobody? If the, if the blood pressure was 120 over 80, the top number is 120, which is systolic pressure. Then I have to subtract from that diastolic pressure, which is the bottom number, which in that case would be 80. So what is the pulse pressure? 40. 40. Very good. It's 40. 120 minus 80 is 40. All right. So that's the first value we have to calculate. So then you have to put 40 right here. You take 40 and divide by three. Somebody do that math for me. 13.3. 13.3, that's what I thought it was. So this value, pulse pressure, which is 40, divided by three would be 13.3. You then have to add back 80 because 80 is the diastolic pressure. So what's 13.3 plus 80? 93.3. Very good. And that's what the normal uh, mean arterial pressure is supposed to be. 93.3. Now, I should have put in here also, I didn't write. Do you guys know what the value is, the unit that we measure pressure in? Millimeters of mercury. Very good. Millimeters of mercury. got to write that in. Oh, I put a nine there. I don't know how that is. All right. So millimeters of mercury is the unit of pressure. So we would say then that the mean arterial pressure for 120 over 80 would be 93.3 millimeters of mercury of pressure. Now I will say this on the physiology test, I'm going to put numbers in there that aren't real numbers, but it's going to be numbers that allow you to do this calculation without having to have a calculator, all right? So it's gonna be very simple, low numbers, and it's gonna you know, work out without having to use a calculator. But the basic thing is, is you have to know the formula on how to calculate it. So these are really the two formulas you have to know. This is just definitions. So the mean arterial pressure, pulse pressure divided by three, plus diastolic pressure. And so you just have to know how to get the pulse pressure, pretty easy systolic minus diastolic pressure all right so I'm, i think i have a question or two on the on the physiology test for that that's why i specifically wanted to go over it i usually go over it on a board but obviously we're not in the classroom all right so if you have any questions about that you know just let me know and you can practice your own numbers you know go plug in a few numbers to see what it comes out to be and, and uh, practice with it all right all right now Blood pressure is dependent upon really three things. How much blood the heart pumps out every minute into the system, what the blood volume is, and what is the total resistance of the blood vessels in the body. Resistance can change. I will say this though, anything that makes resistance increase makes your pressure increase. And it really has to because put it to you like this, 
if you were trying to get out of a door, but somebody was pushing on it, you literally have to push harder than the other person's pushing in order for the door to move. So that's the same thing with blood. If the resistance goes up for whatever reasons we're about to talk about, then the heart has to generate more force to move the blood through a higher resistant artery. Does that make sense? So basically resistance and blood pressure are direct proportions. If one goes up, the other one's going to go up. So what are the parameters that can change the resistance of an artery or the vessels in the body? Well, the size of the blood vessel. What is the diameter of the blood vessel means something. And so the actual calculation for this deals with radius. I don't, you know, the radius is half of a diameter. I typically just say diameter. And really what we're concerned with on this one, this is the most important parameter right here, by the way. The most important thing that changes resistance and, and thus pressure and blood flow is vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So let me go back up to this artery picture real quick. You see the smooth muscle in this tunica media? If that smooth muscle contracts, it makes the diameter of the blood vessel decrease. It gets smaller. If the smooth muscle around the vessel relaxes, then the diameter gets bigger. So when the smooth muscle contracts and the diameter gets smaller, that's called vasoconstriction. If the smooth muscle relaxes and the diameter gets bigger, that's called vasodilation. So you may have heard of those terms before, but now they have some physiological ramifications that happen in our body. What happens if a vessel vasoconstricts? Or what happens if a blood vessel vasodilates, right? Well, it's pretty simple. I'm just going to give it to you right now. Vasoconstriction increases resistance and thus increases pressure in that portion of the body. It also, though, will decrease the volume of blood that can flow through that tissue. Because let's face it, if you make the diameter of the blood vessel smaller, less blood volume can get there, get through it. On the other hand, if you vasodilate a blood vessel, make it get bigger in diameter, the resistance drops. And yeah, the pressure will drop a little bit. But what it does do is it allows for a larger volume of blood to flow through the vessel to the tissue. So I'm going to give you a, for instance, this is something that I teach in AMP one and you probably got it as well. The fight or flight response during a fight or flight response, which is a sympathetic event, certain blood, certain organs in the body have to receive more blood volume than other organs in the body. And at least in my class, I called those organs either essential organs or non-essential organs. Because let's face it, if you're going through a major fight or flight response because somebody's chasing you down a dark alley trying to hurt you, your stomach does not need a whole bunch of blood flow going to it so you can digest your hamburger you ate for lunch. So here's the kicker. If your muscles have to work harder than normal so that you can run or fight hard to survive, obviously your muscles need more blood flow to them. Makes sense, right? They got to make a lot of ATP. So in order for our body to send more blood volume to a particular organ or tissue, you have to take blood away from another organ or tissue because you only have a set volume of blood in the body. So if I have to send more blood to my muscles, my liver, my heart, my lungs, and my brain, which are all essential organs if I'm about to die. My muscles have to work hard. My liver has to put sugar in the blood for me so I can make ATP. My heart has to pump more blood for me. I have to breathe deeper and faster to oxygenate the blood. So the lungs have to work harder. And then my brain has to work hard because uh, it has to be able to think and then regulate all these activities. So those essential organs have to increase blood flow. 
But what organs are not essential during a fight or flight response? Well, your digestive system. You don't have to digest your hamburger. Your reproductive system. You don't have to reproduce if you're about to die. Your urinary system even. Your kidneys can stop producing urine for a very short period of time during an extreme fight or flight response. So, and also your skin. So all of these non-essential areas in the body, we have to vasoconstrict the blood vessels there, which increases resistance and pressure and forces the blood out of that tissue that allows that blood to go to another tissue in the body. And what I failed to mention to you last time was this, blood can only ever move down a pressure gradient. So that means that blood's gonna move from where it's higher pressure to where it's lower pressure. So if I need to move blood from one organ to another one, I need a vasoconstrict in one organ, but vasodilate in the other organ. Because if I vasoconstrict, I'm gonna increase resistance which increases pressure. On the other end, where I'm vasodilating, I'm gonna decrease resistance and I'm gonna decrease pressure, which promotes blood to move from that higher pressure area where we vasoconstricted to the lower pressure area where we vasodilated. Pretty cool, huh? Well, I know it's not cool, but did that make sense to you guys so far? All right, if you have a question about it, just let me know. I'm trying to put it in as simple terms as possible, all right? So resistance is going to change in order to help us alternate where blood needs to be in the body. Now, when you're just lying down on the couch, everything's pretty much constant. Your blood flow to the different tissues in the body are about the same, unless you just ate a heavy meal, then we send a lot of blood to the digestive system, but that's a little different. But the main changes that I want you guys to try and understand is what happens when you're exercising? What happens when you're very scared, a fight or flight response, rather than what's happening if you're just sitting down or lying down? And the main things occur because there's changes in blood vessels with resistance. There's changes with the heart, the cardiac output that we covered on Monday. And I'm going to revisit those parameters here in a second so that we can review them, all right? So ultimately, out of these three parameters that affect resistance, the most important one physiologically is vasoconstriction and vasodilation. The size of the lumen of a blood vessel. Oh, do y'all know what a lumen is, by the way? All right, Leslie says yes, but if some people don't, the a lumen is just the open space of either a blood vessel or a hollow organ. So for instance, the lumen of your stomach is where your food goes when you swallow food in the lumen. Now, blood viscosity typically stays about the same. This is the thickness of blood, by the way, the viscosity of it. Um, blood viscosity is regulated in our body and is maintained pretty much the same, but it can change with certain disease states or uh, certain physiological abnormalities that we're not covering. But under normal conditions, our blood is a little thicker than water. <laughs> I made a pun. All right, so your blood is a little bit thicker. Now, if blood viscosity can increase, which it can, <clears throat> it makes the resistance go up. If viscosity, however, goes down, the resistance goes down. So, this is the one that we really don't want to change. We want this to stay constant. However, let me give you a for instance. Someone that is in severe dehydration, they don't have, they lost water. They lost the water from their blood, but guess what? All the blood cells, all the solutes are still in there. They don't leave. So when you lose your water from the blood, the blood's going to get thicker. And that increases viscosity. So there's a condition called polycythemia. I put it in the cardiovascular system chapter in the blood chapter we're gonna cover um, next week. But something called polycythemia, that's when someone has too many red blood cells per unit volume of blood. So their blood has too many cells in it relative to the volume of water and the viscosity of the blood goes up. The problem with that is that if the viscosity goes up, resistance goes up, 
which means the heart has to generate higher pressures to move the blood through a high resistant artery. And over a long period of time, that would damage the artery, all right? Now, if someone is overhydrated, because you can have too much water, um, and it can induce something called water intoxication. I'm going to cover that in the last chapter, at least in lecture. So if someone's overhydrated, the viscosity can go down a little bit, which would drop the resistance. The last parameter we also don't change physiologically, the actual total length of a blood vessel means something. If blood vessel length can increase, it would increase resistance, which means the heart would have to generate more pressure to move the blood through a higher resistant artery. And over time, it damages the artery again. So this happens in obesity. So when people gain a lot of weight, their vessels increase throughout all of that adipose tissue. It's one reason, not the only reason, but one reason that leads to hypertension in people that are overweight. Um, there's a number of other factors as well, beyond the scope of this little lecture that I'm doing right now. But um, the longer blood stays in the vessel, the more resistant it will meet. And the more resistance that the blood meets, the heart has to generate a higher pressure to move that blood through the vessel, all right? So these are the three main parameters that's affecting resistance. And anything that makes resistance increase makes the pressure increase, again. So here's a little summary chart. Again, we're gonna cover this in lecture. If you're in lecture, we're gonna get a little head start on it now. There's two parts to this chart. Over here on the left is what we covered on Monday, cardiac output and the parameters that affect cardiac output, heart rate and stroke volume and the parameters that affect those parameters. So I'm gonna go back over them briefly in a second. Now for the blood vessel chapter, everything that's in blue on the right hand side are the new parameters that affect mean arterial pressure or the blood pressure in the body. So what are those things? Well, resistance is going to affect pressure from this chapter, cardiac output from the heart chapter, but what affects the resistance? Oh, this is systemic vascular resistance, by the way, SBR. In your engage manual, they use uh, TPR, total peripheral resistance. So total peripheral resistance, I kind of attribute to being the same. It's slightly different because it's, it's a total resistance all over the body. Systemic vascular resistance is specifically the resistance in the systemic circuit alone. So nonetheless, when I use the word resistance on the test, or if I use TPP, which is total peripheral resistance, it's the same as this, all right? Systemic vascular resistance. So here are the parameters, again, that affect resistance. If we're trying to increase pressure for whatever reason, these are the changes that, that could occur. If you increase the number of red blood cells in, in someone, which induces polycythemia per unit volume, you have more cells than normal, that increases viscosity. If you increase viscosity, it increases resistance. If you increase resistance, it's gonna increase pressure. Now, this is not necessarily what we want to happen, but it, it, it can happen in people that are polycythemic. So this, this line over here, we really don't want to change. We want our viscosity to stay the same physiologically. So it goes up and down slightly, but very, very little in a normal, healthy individual. And then you see over here, increased body size, like in obesity, can increase vessel length. And the longer blood stays in a vessel, because the vessel's longer, it meets more resistance, which increases pressure. So this is how you read the chart to know what, how the pressure can change from these parameters. Now, physiologically, the only one that is relevant and how we alter blood flow in our body specifically to send more blood somewhere and less blood somewhere else is through vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So obviously on this chart, they're showing you how we increase pressure. So if you vasoconstrict a blood vessel, you decrease the size of the vessel and notice they put radius here on the test. I think I, I just put vasoconstriction or I put decreased diameter. I typically don't use radius, but the reason why they do that is because the calculation to calculate it is one over four, uh, one over R to the fourth power. So it's an inverse proportion and R is the radius. So we're not gonna calculate what the resistance is using the formula. 
You just have to know if it increases or would decrease because of how the parameters change. So I'm not gonna make us do real numbers in the, in the formula. So if vasoconstriction then increases resistance and pressure, if someone, let's say someone is, is losing blood volume. If someone is losing blood volume, this is, comes from our talk on Monday. If someone is losing blood volume, would you say their blood pressure goes up or down? Somebody unmute and holler at me. Down. Very good. If you lose blood volume, it's going to go down. So guess what the body's going to try and do if someone's losing volume? Their body is going to try and compensate for that by trying to increase their blood pressure, right? So the quickest thing that our body does immediately for a very short-term regulation of pressure is vasoconstrict and or vasodilate. So if we have to moderate our pressure very quickly, our brain, our cardiovascular center, which we're going to look at in a second, is going to send out information that's going to cause vasoconstriction in certain places of our body that will help increase pressure. And that's why this parameter is the most important one. So if our blood pressure is falling for whatever reason, uh-oh, our pressure is getting too low, we better vasoconstrict somewhere, which would increase resistance, which was going to help increase our pressure. So that's really why we're going over that talk. How do we change pressure, right? And out of all these parameters, this is the one that we, we manipulate physiologically, the diameter of a blood vessel. Now let's review these parameters briefly on cardiac output. This is what we covered on Monday. So notice that our blood pressure is dependent upon how much blood the heart pumps out every minute, which is cardiac output, and what the vessel resistance is, all right? So ultimately, if you can increase the amount of blood the heart pumps out every minute, you increase your pressure. If you increase resistance by vasoconstricting somewhere, you increase your pressure, right? Now, let's say somebody's pressure was too high. We would wanna do the opposite. We would want to, in some way, decrease cardiac output, which would decrease pressure, and you would want to vasodilate in order to decrease resistance to decrease pressure. I'm gonna give you a, for instance, with a vasodilator. Everybody knows the drug Viagra, I'm sure by now, and all of the other ED meds. And you might not know exactly what, how they work, but you know that probably they're a vasodilator. Nitric oxide is a vasodilator in our body, and there's classes of meds that increase that vasodilator. Viagra was originally designed to treat coronary artery disease. And it was given to people in uh, the studies that had blockages and whatnot. And so to increase blood flow to the heart, what would you want to do? Well, you want to vasodilate. You want to allow more blood volume to get through the vessel. So what the doctors did is they, they developed a vasodilator. One, a drug that increases the vasodilator, nitric oxide. Well, it just so happens that all the males in the study had a side effect when they were on the Viagra study. And it happened to be an erection, obviously, and the side effect became the primary uh, mode of action for that drug because it was so strong with that. Now, Viagra is also given to other people other than for ED. I don't know if you know that. I'm gonna get off the tangent in a second. It's also given to people with lupus because in lupus, especially ones that have vasculitis, they have decreased blood flow to their fingers and toes. So they're prescribed some of these ED type meds to help vasodilate in their body help increase blood volume to the extremities. So ultimately I mentioned uh, nitric oxide because you need to know some va the, a, a vasodilator and nitric oxide is one. And then I'm gonna, I already taught you some of the vasoconstrictors and I'm gonna mention them again before we're done. So let's look at the parameters for cardiac output. Ultimately cardiac output is dependent upon two things. How many times a minute your heart beats, heart rate, and how much blood is pumped out of the heart on each beat stroke volume. So what controls them? Well, let's do heart rate first. That's the easiest case. If we're trying to increase cardiac output, because let's say you're getting up and you're jumping on a treadmill and you're starting to work out. If you're starting to work out, we need to send more blood somewhere. You need to increase cardiac output. So how do we increase heart rate? Well, heart rate is mainly affected by the sympathetic nervous system and 
sympathetic hormones to increase heart rate. Heart rate is then affected by the parasympathetic system, which releases acetylcholine, and that decreases heart rate. So that's what you see in these boxes right here. So if we were trying to increase our heart rate to increase cardiac output because we're starting to work out, our nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, would fire to the heart. It would dump out a norepinephrine on the pacemaker, which speeds it up. Norepinephrine is a catecholamine. It's a sympathetic neurotransmitter. It's also a sympathetic hormone. Even though we don't call it sympathetic, I like to link the terms together because they, even though the adrenal medulla is releasing it, they work with the sympathetic system. So basically epinephrine and norepinephrine, adrenaline and noradrenaline gives us our adrenaline rush. Norepinephrine comes from the sympathetic neurons to the heart, increases heart rate. And epinephrine and norepinephrine comes from the adrenal medulla. So that gets in the blood both of these systems, the hormones and the neurotransmitters, increase your heart rate, which helps increase cardiac output. As it turns out, sympathetic, sympathetic stimulation to the heart also increases the force of contraction, which increases stroke volume, right? And those adrenal medulla, adrenal medulla hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine, are increasing contraction force and increasing stroke volume. So epinephrine and norepinephrine are called catecholamines that's a generic name for them the catecholamines increase heart rate and stroke volume to increase cardiac output now the parasympathetic system is a little bit different well it's a lot different but in the fact that the parasympathetic system is going to dump out acetylcholine not adrenaline so the parasympathetic system dumps out acetylcholine on the pacemaker which is inhibitory and it slows your heart rate down. And if you slow your heart rate down, it, slow, it, it decreases cardiac output. Now notice that the parasympathetic nervous system does not affect stroke volume. You see how there's no line coming from the parasympathetic area over here to this box? That's because there's no parasympathetic neurons that go to the ventricles. Now we have sympathetic neurons that go to the pacemaker and the ventricles. And so that's why both heart rate and stroke volume is affected by the sympathetic system. But the parasympathetic system has no effect on the contraction force of a ventricle. So that's why it doesn't affect stroke volume. So parasympathetic system just affects heart rate, which slows it down. All right, so the other factor that is going to be important in cardiac output and thus blood pressure is one that we just, I just mentioned a minute ago and somebody answered the question for me and that's blood volume. So the amount of blood volume that's in the system means something. And if you can increase blood volume, you're gonna increase pressure. Why is that? Well, look at the top. If we can increase the volume of blood in the body, you're gonna increase that volume of blood that returns to the heart, which is called venous return. Just because of the sheer nature, you have more volume you're gonna return more. So if you can return more blood volume back to the heart, you're gonna increase the preload on the ventricle, which is the stretch. If you increase the preload because you increased the EDV, you're gonna increase the contraction force of the ventricle. And if you increase the contraction force of a ventricle, the ventricle is going to eject more blood out on that beat just from the sheer nature of its contracting harder. So that's going to increase stroke volume. So anything that increases volume or increases the return of blood volume called venous return back to the heart will increase the EDV, which is the end diastolic volume, which increases the preload, which is a stretch on the wall of a ventricle, and if you increase the stretch on the wall of a ventricle, the preload, you increase contractility. And if you increase the contraction force, you increase stroke volume, which increases cardiac output, which is going to increase the blood pressure. So hopefully you guys followed that. Now, we have some accessory pumps. Now, you all know the heart pumps your blood through the body into the tissues and ultimately back to the heart itself. 
The heart is generating the force that moves the blood. But we have what are called accessory pumps. You might not have ever thought about it, but if you're working out and you're using your muscles, your muscles are contracting and squeezing on the veins that go through the muscle. Luckily, the veins have valves in them. So when your skeletal muscle squeeze on a vein, it's going to squish the blood through the vessel to each section where the valves are. So just by the nature of you working out and using your muscles, you're going to automatically increase venous return. So if you really want to know why your blood flow and blood pressure increases in the body when you're working out, at least dealing with stroke volume, it's because we inherently increase how much blood returns back to the heart faster. If you're working out and sque your muscles are squeezing on veins, the blood's going to be squished back to the heart faster than if you're just lying down on the couch. And if you're returning the blood back to the heart faster, you're going to put more blood in a ventricle and will be available to be pumped out. That's called the EDV. So you return more blood to the ventricle. You're putting more blood in it. That's the EDV is going to make the wall stretch. That's the preload. When it goes to contract, it's going to boom, contract harder, and you're going to eject more blood out. That's stroke volume. So that's why volume of blood and how much we return to the heart means something. All right. All right. We also have a respiratory pump. When you're breathing deep and fast, you're also squeezing on the veins in the thoracic cavity because we have pressure changes in our thoracic cavity. And then there's something called venoconstriction. I kind of interchange the term with vasoconstriction. Technically, vasoconstriction implies a constriction of the small arteries in the body. Venoconstriction implies a constriction of the small veins in the body or veins in the body. All right, but all of that returns blood back to the heart faster. <coughs> all right, excuse me. So all of these parameters you need to keep straight. How do we increase cardiac output, which increases pressure? And how do we increase resistance, which increases pressure? So just review those parameters. Now, I just have a, a couple more things, one, really one more thing to talk about and we'll be done. I know your brain is probably tired, but this is about the length of time it takes me to cover this physiology. Really, this chart that you're looking at here on this slide is what we covered in the, cardio, in, in the heart chapter on Monday. But it's also in the blood vessel chapter for, the, for the, uh, the sheer reason that the cardiovascular center, this little purple circle down here, is located in the medulla oblongata, and it regulates activity of the heart and our blood vessels. So that's why we have to look at it again. The main thing here, though, that we need to focus on is the same thing that we kind of focused on when I taught it on Monday. What are these receptors and what do they do, All right? So again, I'll go over them. Proprioceptors monitor if you're moving relative to if you're sitting still or lying down. So if you're sitting still or lying down, the proprioceptors are telling the control center, hey, we don't, we don't have to increase blood flow because they're just lying down. And if we don't have to increase blood flow, we normally get automatically parasympathetic output when you're at rest. So when you're sitting down or you're not active or you're lying down, the parasympathetic nervous system overrides the sympathetic system. So the parasympathetic, the, the, C, the CV center would say, yep, we're just resting. Let's have some parasympathetic output. So what does parasympathetic output do? It decreases heart rate, which decreases cardiac output, which decreases your pressure. That's why when you're nice and relaxed and you're lying down, if somebody took your pressure, it would be lower than if you're running on a treadmill. <coughs> All right, so ultimately though, let's say we have to increase our pressure. Now we're getting up, we're going to jump on our bike or we're going you know, walk around, we're going to the gym, whatever we're doing. We have to increase pressure and blood flow to certain tissues in the body. So how do we do that? Well, these receptors are gonna fire. So the proprioceptors fire to the CV center and says, hey, they're moving around. We need to increase pressure because your arms and legs are moving. These receptors monitor your arms and legs moving because they're in and around your joints of the body. 
CV center says, yep, they're moving around. We better increase pressure and blood flow to the muscles of the body. So how do we do that? Sympathetic output. Here's one thing you can keep straight, even if you don't understand all of it, it's pretty simple. If you ever need a decreased pressure in blood flow, you're gonna get parasympathetic output. If you ever need to increase blood pressure and blood flow, you're gonna get sympathetic output. So just keep that straight and that'll help you answer some questions. So we need to increase our, flow, our blood pressure and blood flow. So we're gonna have sympathetic output Remember, sympathetic output goes to both the heart, uh, goes to both heart and blood vessels. Sympathetic output to the heart is going to increase heart rate because it goes, it dumps out catecholamines on the pacemaker, norepinephrine on the pacemaker, and it goes to the ventricle, which causes for an increased contraction force, which is going to increase stroke volume. So contractility affects stroke volume, and then heart rate, well, just affects heart rate, right? So uh, sympathetic system increases both heart rate and stroke volume by increasing contractility, which increases pressure. Sympathetic stimulation goes to most blood vessels in the body. So most blood vessels in the body receive only sympathetic stimulation. So how do we control vessel diameter if we only have one type of nervous system affecting it? Well, it depends on if the, ner if the sympathetic nervous system is firing, and how much is it firing? Is it a very strong response or is it a weak sympathetic response? So ultimately, some blood vessels in the body will vasoconstrict, whereas other ones are gonna vasodilate. So I'm not, it's not my goal to tell you right now, everywhere in the body, which ones dilate, which ones constrict. But I will mention this, that fight or flight summary I just gave a minute ago, if you can remember what's essential, and what's non-essential organs if you're about to die? That little talk I just gave. The non-essential organs, we always vasoconstrict. The essential organs is where we're gonna vasodilate. Now it's also beyond the scope of this little lecture for me to tell you how that happens. That's covered in really AMP1 in chapter 15. But it's due to the fact that we have different types of receptors that bind epinephrine and norepinephrine. They're called the adrenergic receptors. If you remember alpha and beta receptors, some are excitatory and some are inhibitory. I'm not going back over that. But the excitatory ones would cause vasoconstriction. The inhibitory ones would cause vasodilation. So in that regards, when we have sympathetic output, we're going to increase cardiac output to help increase pressure and blood flow through the vessels. In certain areas, we're going to decrease, we're going to increase pressure and decrease blood volume and in, with vasoconstriction, but in other areas, we're gonna decrease pressure and resistance, but increase blood volume. That's through vasodilation. That's what happens when we increase blood flow to our muscles, when we're running on a treadmill. All right, so th these are the inputs and the outputs. Baroreceptors monitor pressure directly. We're gonna go over the baroreceptive reflex right now, and that's the last thing that we have to do. Um, and then uh, for physiology, and then chemoreceptors monitor the chemistry of the blood. So if the chemistry of the blood is changing, if you have too much acid in the blood, your pH drops. If you are dumping in more CO2 and you're removing more O2, that means you're working out. So when you work out, your pH goes down a little bit, you have too much acid, your CO2 goes up a little bit, and your O2 goes down a little bit, the chemoreceptors fire to the brain saying, hey, we have too much acid, we have too much CO2, we don't have enough oxygen, we need to increase blood flow to the tissues. And the respiratory system is affected at the same time, although we're not talking about it, you would increase your breathing rates. So we have sympathetic output during those times that we work out because of what these receptors are telling the cardiovascular center. So let's go over the bar receptive reflex. Here's a negative feedback loop that helps regulate blood pressure. So let's say that some stress or stimulus is decreasing your blood pressure. Maybe somebody's losing some blood volume. That can happen when you're really sick. Severe diarrhea, severe vomiting, um, severe dehydration. 
or if someone has a wound and they're bleeding out, losing blood directly. All of those conditions can cause your blood pressure to go down because you're losing blood volume. So whatever the stressor is, which is typically undefined, although there are specific reasons, in our little feedback loops are undefined. Some stress is decreasing our pressure. So what do we have to do? Well, the receptors that monitor pressure have to send information about those pressure changes to the control center. So those borrow receptors are located in the carotid arteries, really in the area called the carotid sinus, and in the aortic arch. The borrow receptors in the carotid sinus monitors blood pressure to your brain and will initiate reflexes to alter blood pressure to the brain because all the blood that goes to your brain, arterial blood that goes to your brain is going up through the carotid arteries, by the way. The bar receptors in the aortic arch monitor blood pressure to the rest of the body, to the systemic circuit, the rest of the systemic circuit. So these bar receptors are gonna say, yep, blood pressure's dropping. We better send that information to the control center, which is in the medulla oblongata. So when the blood pressure drops, the rate at which the neurons fire slows down. And that's how the cardiovascular center knows that the blood pressure is low because the rate of neuron firing drops. So the CV center says, yep, blood pressure fell. We better increase blood pressure. So what type of output do we need to increase blood pressure? Hmm. Oh, sympathetic output because in all of its regards, the sympathetic system increases your cardiac output and resistance. So the medulla oblongata sends out sympathetic output to the heart. So we increase heart rate. We increase the force of contraction, which increases cardiac output. And if you increase cardiac output, you increase pressure. Sympathetic stimulation will also cause, cause vasoconstriction, which increases resistance which increases pressure. So this is just a summary of everything we just talked about, really. And then the other part of this reflex involves the adrenal medulla. So whenever we have a sympathetic response, the adrenal medulla is affected because the adrenal medulla is told to release epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood whenever we have a sympathetic event. The sympathetic nervous system also targets the adrenal medulla. If you remember from AMP1, those preganglionic neurons of the sympathetic system go straight into the adrenal medulla. So when they fire, they dump out epinephrine in there. I'm sorry, it dumps out acetylcholine in there, which causes the gland to dump out epinephrine and norepinephrine. Because all preganglionic neurons dump out acetylcholine. So the chromophin cells in the adrenal medulla respond to acetylcholine by secreting epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood. And epinephrine and norepinephrine, whether it's coming from the adrenal medulla or it's coming from sympathetic neurons, all bring about the same effect. They increase cardiac output and they increase resistance, which increases pressure. And this loop is gonna run and run and run and run until your pressure is back to normal. And if your pressure is back to normal, the bar receptors fire to the CV center saying, hey, pressure's back to normal. We can stop the sympathetic output and the, and the negative loop turns off. And so we adjust our blood pressure in these ways and blood flow in those ways. Now I'll also put in here this, uh, this link you can review for the negative feedback of blood pressure. And I also included this, I usually have this in lecture, but I like this chart because it shows all in one place some of the hormones and their effect on the different parts of the system for blood pressure. What increases pressure? What decreases pressure? So just review these hormones um, and know what aspect they're doing. Like we talked about angiotensin II, we talked about antidiuretic hormone. What does that do? Oh, they're vasoconstrictors on blood vessels. What are the vasodilators? Well, I mentioned nitric oxide already. Um, atrial natriuretic peptide has a small vasodilatory effect in the body. 
Um, don't worry about epinephrine for now because you have to know where the receptors are. These alpha and beta receptors, I'm not covering this in lab. We're not going back over that, all right? So what I want you to know about epinephrine and norepinephrine is it, it brings about vasoconstriction. I'll mention some of this in lecture because depending on if you have the alpha ones or the beta twos, you're either going to constrict or you're going to dilate. It's just the, the, the alpha one and beta one receptors are excitatory. Alpha twos and beta twos are inhibitory. Just depends on where they are. But you can see those beta two receptors are on all the vessels and the essential organs like your heart and your skeletal muscle. So those vessels will dilate. The vessels in your skin and your abdominal organs are going to constrict. So that's why that's there, all right? So just review that um, for some of the dilators, increases and decreases in pressure. All right, so that's it for the PowerPoint. Does anybody have any specific question before we take a little break? Um, do we have to know the common blood vessel disorders? Um, no, I'm not putting that on the physiology test. Uh oh, I'm glad you asked that, by the way. Let me see. Let me stop sharing for a second so I can pull up my other screen. I forget. I forgot to do that. I wanted to show y'all in the lab manual. Um, where you're reviewing for the physiology. So let me do that. Let me reshare my screen right here. Share. All right. I think y'all can see it. All right. So let's go to exercise three. Also, a couple people said they couldn't buy this yet or had a problem with it. I hope y'all figured that out. If you have a problem, I think you need to clear your cookies and clear your cache and totally reboot your computer and change the browser when the, the type of browser you're using, if y'all are having problems with that. You should be using Firefox or something like that, not Safari. Mr. Russell, or Russell. Go ahead. Um, so I know I had emailed you about that um, situation and I tried, yeah. um, so I cleared my cache and the cookies and I ended up trying it on another computer as well and it still didn't work. So It still didn't work? No. Uh, what browser are you using? Um, I was using Chrome and then I used, um, what's it called? Um, Safari. Firefox. You need to download Firefox browser window. Okay. For some reason on some people's computers, uh, depending on the settings, Chrome doesn't work in the Engage site. Now my Chrome works, I don't know why, but I've been using it forever. But there's something you have to disable in settings. I think it's like uh, you have to disable cookies or you have to activate cookies. I forget which way you have to do it. Um, but instead of messing with all that, I know that Firefox works. So okay. download the Firefox browser and see if that works and try and do that immediately because you have to start working on these quizzes. All right. So let me pull up uh, the chapter and show you. The first part of the chapter just goes over some blood vessel morphology right here. You, you can really skip over that, all right? The physiology stuff that's going to be on the test is going to start past all this anatomy. These are all the blood vessels right here. Blood vessel physiology, see where it starts? Total peripheral resistance, TPR. Um, so that's why I put that little PowerPoint together to go over the different parameters so, and, so we can see a picture. This is basically the same information with all the different parameters. Um, so you can go through that um, and you're going to stop. You see where it goes over mean arterial pressure. You don't have to learn these equations. Just learn the one that I generated for you. I think it's a little easier to, to remember than mean arterial pressure is one third systolic plus two thirds diastolic. But some people like this one. You can do it any way you want, really. You're going to come out with a very similar result. So once you get down to um, shock, right here. I'm not going to cover shock on this test. We're going to do it in lecture. You should know what hypotension and hypertension is though. I mean, I think that's pretty important. Everybody knows hypo is low and hyper is high, right? So once you get down through these two definitions right here, that's where you're going to stop in the engage manual for the physiology. All right. So is that kind of clear? Yes. All right. So what I think, um, we're going to do right now is take a little break because normally in lab, I would take a break after we do this, 
Uh, you can clear your head a little bit. You know, you can get something to drink or go to the bathroom, whatever you got to do. And so then we're going to start back up in 15 minutes. So that's 1230. And I'm going to see if I, we can play this little game. If it doesn't work too well, then we'll just end the meeting unless people have questions. Uh, but if it kind of works, I, I think it'll be a fun way to try and review the, the blood vessels. All right. So I'm going to go take a short break. You guys can take a short break. Meet me back here in 15.